A group of scientists from major U.S. universities has called today for the serious scientific study of unidentified flying objects. They say that the scientific community could learn from reports about UFOs or if it could overcome the fear of ridicule that comes with studying them. None of the mysteries of the skies, those lights and flashes and odd shapes that many people believe are evidence that we're not alone. Now, a group of prominent scientists believes it's time to separate fact from science fiction. More on that from NBC's George Lewis. March of last year, strange lights sighted over Phoenix, Arizona, later explained as flares dropped from airplanes during a military training exercise. But there are plenty of other unexplained UFO sightings. Stanford University physicist Peter Sturrock is one of nine scientists who believe these incidents merit further investigation. I'm simply saying that if there's an interest in getting to the bottom of the phenomenon, then there has to be serious scientific research to get to the bottom of it. The scientists do not want to start people giggling about little green men from other planets. In their privately funded report published today, they focus on incidents involving physical evidence of UFOs. This sighting in Vancouver, British Columbia in 1981 among the examples. A metallic looking disc photographed by a family on a picnic. But the publisher of Skeptic Magazine, which debunks UFO stories, questions the need for further study. In no way does this represent mainstream science at all, who really has given UFOs uh, a fair shake, I think. In Roswell, New Mexico, many people claim that alien beings crash-landed nearby in the summer of 1947. A former analyst for the Defense Department and the CIA, who believes what crashed near Roswell was really U.S. military hardware, endorses the call for more scientific investigation of UFOs. What it will do is fuel interest in the scientific community in taking a look at the solid UFO data that's there and that has been there for a long time. The scientists in their report don't draw any conclusions about whether we have been visited by aliens from outer space. Or as they say on the X-Files, the truth is out there. George Lewis, NBC News, Los Angeles. now is Linda. She says she's been abducted by extraterrestrials not once but several times in her life. She's in silhouette today because she fears her family will be in danger if she reveals her identity. Now her story, guys, is a little bit different because her abduction happened right here in New York City in front of many witnesses. Linda, tell us what happened. Uh, apparently, uh, the reason, the real reason why I'm here is because um, in shadow, because I'm trying to protect my family from the ridicule. I understand that, but what, tell us what happened. Well, apparently, uh, one evening when I went to bed and uh, I was in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, you know, a lot of us say our prayers before we go to sleep, uh, I felt a presence in the room and um, I felt numbness uh, start creeping up from my toes up and uh, I closed my eyes because I was very frightened and uh, then I realized uh, if I was going to protect my family and me, I'd have to open up my eyes. So I did, I opened my eyes and I saw this thing standing there at the foot of my bed. Now you have to understand something, we all put locks on our doors for a reason, to keep outsiders from coming in. But somebody was in your room? Uh, yes. And what did this person look like, or, or, or thing? Well, you know, I, it sounds ridiculous. Uh, I don't like to say it was an alien, all I can say it, is that it was a thing and it, it was wasn't put in my bed and it had uh, gigantic black eyes uh, it had a, uh, a huge head and what, what did it do to you did it touch you did it talk to you did it no it didn't talk to me and I'm not an alien and I, I you know it, it's just an experience that, uh, that happened I to had you consciously but uh, what had happened here was uh, I took a pillow and th threw it threw it at this thing and uh, it fell back. It, and that's when I felt uh, I might have made a mistake by throwing that pillow. I thought it was going to disappear get even with me and, and right. it wouldn't hurt my family. And, but it didn't hurt you? Uh, apparently not, because by the, between the time I threw the pillow uh, and the time I fell, my, felt myself drop back into my bed, uh, there was some missing time there. Like there's like a gray area. A, a, a gray area like happened. Tanner had a gray area of two hours. I understand from that experience you now have a scar on your nose and you don't know why that happened to you. 
Oh, yes. Well, that was at the beginning. In 1977, I found a lump on the right side of my nose. I thought it was a tumor. So I went to a specialist, and he examined my nose, and he told me that uh, I had built up cartilage inside my nose from uh, a scar. So I'd never had surgery before, and he did ask me, why have you had surgery? Mm -hmm. So I said I didn't have surgery outside of an impacted wisdom tooth. Huh. Maybe this scar that she, he found in my nose was made uh, with a fingernail. Hmm. Ha so Linda, that's what I ha hang on, because I want to get someone else involved that knows your case very well. Also joining us today is Bud Hopkins, one of America's top ufologists, who heard Linda's story and made her the subject for his latest book, Witness the True Story of the Brooklyn, the Brooklyn Bridge UFO Abductions. Mm -hmm. Bud, thank you so much for being here today. What do you make of Linda's story and all of the stories we've heard today? Uh, well, this is just the beginning in Linda's story. The most important thing is that I began uh, hearing from and being able to, to contact people who witnessed Linda and three small figures come out the 12th story window uh, of an apartment building down near the Brooklyn Bridge under the brilliant lights of a UFO at 3 in the morning. This took about one minute. And I had witnesses at different locations, uh, all of whom are telling the same story. Uh, these people are extraordinarily uh, credible people. And I have detailed all of this very, very long uh, business. It's very complex in my book. And I suggest if people have doubts or curiosity, they Check read the whole thing. Out. I've noticed that people like to hold their hands up quickly before they've heard the whole story. But we have to hear the story, get the evidence, uh, like any scientific investigation, to know what to do. So wait. did they fly out of the 12-story window? They did were they rolled walk up, out? They were rolled up in a kind of fetal position. They came out the window and then unrolled all simultaneously, according to the witnesses, and went up into the craft. But I'd like to say one thing. You asked me about the people on the panel here. There were at least some young people and children, um, and I think the woman in silver can take care of herself, but the young people here can't. They're people who are, by any stretch of the imagination, are traumatized. I think that even though we're, we're sitting here having trouble believe it, believing it, the proper attitude is one of sympathy and support for anyone who's traumatized. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody reports, if these were, say, rape victims and they were here, we might laugh at them thinking they made up a rape because it got attention or whatnot. But they might have been actually raped, in which mm -hmm. case humor is not the, the proper Mm -hmm. attitude towards them. These people, and, and I'm thinking of Tanner in particular, need the support of at least people caring for what happened to him. And instead of laughing and saying from the outside, was he smoking this or eating that, and his mother had said no, uh, we should be saying he needs somebody to talk to, some help he can get. I have worked so far with eight psychiatrists who come to me because of their own personal abduction experiences. A whole range of psychotherapists, uh, psychologists who have had abduction experiences, so I've there's no hundreds. doubt in your mind, Bud, that this is happening to people. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying that I can tell with any of the people here, but I just can, my, my gut reaction to several of the people is that they look as if they have been traumatized. They absolutely do. Uh, yeah, okay. I, 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 and I agree with And in that case, I think they need support, not laughter. Mm -hmm. Now, skepticism is extraordinarily important. We need to be skeptical. We need to examine every claim and story on its own. But ridicule is really out. Mm -hmm. I think to laugh at these people... Are you guys hearing this? It's a little different, yes. Ricky, it's a little different for a woman who is an adult and who claims right. to be an alien. She can handle it. But for the kids I, and young people, we need to support we them. We need to support All them. All right, we're going to work on that, aren't we, gang? Coming up next, the man who says life on Mars is one thing, but aliens, that's ridiculous. Don't go away. There's much more. Watching Strange Universe, the phenomenal daily news magazine. Project Blue Book, the code name for a 22-year government investigation into the existence of UFOs. In that time, thousands of sightings are reported, many never explained. Was Project Blue Book a serious investigation or, as many are saying, just another part of the cosmic Watergate cover-up? Tremont, Utah, 1952. A Navy cameraman captures film of mysterious dancing lights. An Air Force investigation determines that the lights are really seagulls. Great Falls, Montana, 1956. A minor league baseball coach films two objects racing across the night sky. The Air Force decides they are aircraft. From the time it's launched in 1952, Project Blue Book investigates scores of UFO sightings. There have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers 
of relatively incredible fame. Well, the team splits up in 1969. All but 701 sightings have been accounted for. Retired Air Force Colonel Robert Friend headed up Project Blue Book from 1958 through 1963. I can look anyone directly in the eye and say that during my experience, all of the information that was made available to me, that there is nothing there that would allow me to conclude that we have been visited by alien beings. Of the 701 cases out of the 12,000 plus cases uh, that are left unexplained, that there are a number of reasons why uh, they are in this category. And that can be because there wasn't sufficient information, because we really and truthfully couldn't explain it with the information that we had. Nuclear physicist Stanton Friedman studied the findings of the Air Force investigation into UFOs. Project Blue Book team members say they can look us in the eye and say they found no aliens in their 12,000 plus sightings. Were they kept in the dark? I would say they were kept in the dark. It was pretty good in the early 50s. It died, it was killed in 1969 because it became a front operation. Their goal was to explain every sighting. If they had a twist and turn the data to do it, well, so be it. But if there was no threat to national security, then why did the government spend so many years and so many millions of dollars investigating thousands of UFO sightings? Kevin Randall is a former Air Force captain who's dedicated his life to researching UFOs. Randall says that Blue Book was nothing more than a front. There is absolutely no doubt that there's been a cover-up going on since the beginning of the UFO phenomenon. After 1953, Project Blue Book, the public investigation became little more than a public relations uh, outfit. And the real investigation was conducted by the 4602nd Air Intelligence Service Squadron. And we can say that based on Air Force regulations. So the documentation about the cover-up exists. New York Times reporter Howard Bloom is an expert on the Project Blue Book files. He believes that the government is guilty of a cover-up. There are a great many people uh, in the Pentagon who have rigorously investigated whether or not there have been visitations from this planet. And what they've concluded is they just don't know. One always had the feeling when going through the Blue Book files that there's two Blue Book files. And what they're covering up, perhaps, is not as many UFO people believe that, you know, this really wasn't a weather balloon but a spacecraft. But I think what they were covering up is this isn't a weather balloon, but we don't know what it is. Uh, and that's my feeling. The government is covering up its ignorance. And it's the responsibility of the government uh, to find out what's happening. Some say a Utah farmer who came across a crop circle while working in his barley field. Some say it was the work of aliens who seek to communicate with us. Others maintain the crop circle was only a prank. As senior correspondent Jim Forbes tells us, investigators are still looking for answers. Last month, we showed you this mysterious crop circle cut into a Logan, Utah barley field. Local residents looked to Sheriff Mark Olson with plenty of questions. So armed with his wife and a video camera, Olson searched for answers. What beings cut this picture? If there are intelligent beings from another planet playing in his backyard, Olson wanted to know. So he approached the case with all the vigor he'd give a cattle rustling. And what he's found is a hole at the center of the story. Do you know what happened to me again? Oh, we don't know. Olson's investigation turned up a hole in the center of the circle. We believe that whoever had made the hoax had possibly put in some type of a peg using a string and marking out the circular motion in a, in a, in a complete circle. A closer look revealed that the crop circle was less than perfectly symmetrical, and Olson offers this explanation. Possibly using some type of large piece of plywood and point it on one end and lay it down and then step on it, pick it up, point it again, lay it down, once the circle had been laid out. Olson's conclusion? The crop circle was not the work of extraterrestrials. Earthbound vandals are to blame. But evidence gathered by BLT, an independent research team based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, suggests that Olson is wrong. Biophysicists from this group say plants inside the crop circle are abnormal, genetically damaged. They found similar changes in plants from a 1992 crop circle in England and in this Michigan crop circle last year. What does it all mean? They don't know yet. 
But they do know that genetic damage like this can only come from a powerful energy source, possibly generated by otherworldly technology. Local authorities stick by their earthly interpretation. The Cass County Sheriff's Office is investigating it as a vandalism to the wheat field uh, as opposed to any UFO sightings. BLT Research is conducting soil analysis and genetic testing on the Utah crop circles with the results due out in about three weeks. Mm, that's Reed's Magazine. And now in part four of our Cosmic Watergate series, the UFO controversy meets Capitol Hill. Government scientists, military experts, even former astronauts are all taking their case for full disclosure to Washington. They want you to know what they say the government knows about aliens and UFOs. The president's number one science advisor says there's no real evidence of ET visits. I have the highest clearances you can have. If there was something there, and if it were known to government, I would know about it. But not everyone believes it. Ed Mitchell is an Apollo astronaut who's walked on the moon. I have been working with others who are urging that whatever information government has should now be released to the public. Those others include fellow astronaut Brian O'Leary and philanthropist Lawrence Rockefeller. Lawrence Rockefeller uh, convened a group called the Starlight Coalition uh, that consists of a number of responsible scientists and uh, former astronauts, uh, Ed Mitchell, for example, Gordon Cooper. We've uh, uh, met on a couple of occasions to discuss ways of urging the government to please let us know the truth. O'Leary and Mitchell say a lot of government insiders can't speak up because they've been sworn to secrecy. We know of several people who were in the military and had observed UFO phenomena firsthand, but cannot come forward and talk uh, for fear that, that they will be prosecuted. Robert Dean is a former Army intelligence officer. He says he's taking a risk by coming forward. I'm violating my oath and I'm subject for a $10,000 fine, 10 years in prison, forfeiture of all of my pay and allowances from now and forever. Dean's military vow of silence is no longer stopping him from telling what he says that he learned when he was assigned to the NATO war room in the 60s. There were large numbers of metallic circular objects flying all over Europe. Scott Jones has worked with Lawrence Rockefeller on the UFO disclosure issue. If we are correct, and it is a policy of secrecy and silence, to talk about it at all would be a change of the policy. Scott Jones says he and Lawrence Rockefeller met with President Clinton's science advisor, Dr. John Gibbons, to ask for new studies on UFOs. It was a meeting that John Gibbons doesn't remember. No, I don't know anything about a request uh, uh, or, or funding by uh, Mr. Rockefeller. But Strange Universe has obtained letters between Rockefeller and the White House written after their meetings. From Rockefeller to Gibbons, dear Jack, we appreciate your seeing us so early Wednesday morning to discuss our interest in unidentified flying objects and extraterrestrial intelligence. From Gibbons to Rockefeller, dear Lawrence, I apologize for my silence but was awaiting news from the Air Force. Yesterday, I received the material. Scott Jones says the White House has yet to make the government's secret UFO files public. Former New York Times reporter Howard Bloom conducted his own investigation into Washington's official policy on UFOs. What the government did, I discovered, is they formed a group called the UFO Working Group to investigate the existence of extraterrestrial life. And its very title made a lot of people in Washington uncomfortable. You know, UFOs, that sounds something from the X-Files. They really had an opportunity to look through the government's UFO files and see if there was something hidden there. They, in effect, were given carte blanche to look wherever they wanted to. It wasn't easy for Bloom to get the full story. When I tried to interview people in the UFO working group, and they would send letters saying, don't, don't claim you interviewed me because you didn't. And you would try to track these people down and they weren't at the phone numbers or where they were last time. Uh, there was a deliberate policy by the government to keep the existence of the UFO working group a uh, top secret. The reasonable assumption is that the current administration has decided to follow the, the policy of secrecy and silence. People love mysteries. Uh, at, at the same time, uh, there's no there there, as far as I can tell. But some insist there has been a there there since 1947. It's uh, a cosmic water gate of enormous proportions. My hope is that those who have held on to the secrets for all these years also be granted immunity against prosecution for their violating the trust of the American people so that we can get the information out and we can go on with the truth.
On tomorrow's edition, we'll take a look at the people who are taking on the UFO hunt themselves because they say the government's policy is to hide the truth and find out where you can call if you see a flying saucer. Coming up next... You're watching Strange Universe, the phenomenal daily news magazine. And now another installment of our special series, Cosmic Watergate. A new set of space age explorers are taking matters into their own hands. They're out to prove that alien visitations are real and that they're being ignored by the government. November 17, 1995, the pilot of a Lufthansa jetliner en route to Germany radios in a mysterious flying object. The call is answered by an air traffic controller. It's monitored by Peter Davenport's National UFO Reporting Center in Seattle, Washington. Turner 405, how far up your side did that pass, the traffic pass? It was pretty close. It didn't have any uh, uh, lights, over light, beacon light, or red or green light, only a uh, uh, white light in front and with a long green light. Looked like a UFO. Moments later, the pilot of a British Airways jet en route to London radios in. The same object, different pilot, different part of the Atlantic. The test of the Atlantic is quite right. It looked as if it was going very quickly. It definitely looked uh, faster than normal aircraft. Two commercial pilots reporting a strange glowing object in the night sky. Peter Davenport says it happens all the time. Davenport was trained as a biogeneticist, but has dedicated his life to tracking UFOs. National UFO Reporting Center, good afternoon. He collects unexplained data. Information, he claims, the U.S. government refuses to acknowledge. Perhaps our government has some good reason for not releasing this information. I can't imagine what that reason would be. Davenport believes there is undeniable proof that alien visitations are happening and that the government's involved in a cover-up of epic proportions. All serious-minded ufologists are hopeful that the American government will open its files on the UFO phenomenon, give us more data provide uh, the data that they no doubt have collected. But word from the White House is there's nothing to hide. John Gibbons is an assistant to the president for science and technology. The most important discovery of the 20th century, likely, was the discovery of how ignorant we are. And uh, anyone that would s say for sure they know what's going on out there means they don't know what they're talking about. It appears the government certainly tried. In the early 1960s, NASA launched a program called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. SETI was officially dissolved about three years ago due to cost cutting, but now the search is on again, thanks to private funding. Radio astronomer Seth Shostak is in charge of SETI headquarters in Virginia. We take in that cosmic radio static that's coming from the cosmos, and we analyze it to see if there are any signals there produced, not by nature, but by ET, as it were. Davenport claims SETI's aiming its telescopes too high. They're looking out light years, and we're looking here on the planet Earth. And Davenport says he's having great success. His UFO reporting center often tracks clusters of sightings on the same night. I looked up, and it was a very bright, green, steady light. Okay. Uh, I would say uh, about <laughs> ten times the size of the Uh-huh. Davenport has begun cataloging his UFO data, grouping the shapes and sizes of spaceships so that people can compare the sightings. But he says Americans won't be truly informed until the people in power come clean. I think they're here on the planet Earth every day of the week, and we have good data to back up that statement. But uh, we ufologists are not in control of that issue. That's going to be up to the government, clearly, to do that. Peter Davenport's National UFO Reporting Center offers a hotline for anyone that wants to report an unusual sighting. Here's a number to call. It's in Seattle. Area code 206-722-3000. Now, word of a UFO sighting in Falkirk, Scotland, apparently one of the world's hotspots for UFO activity. Just a few weeks ago, a young couple was able to videotape a UFO. Experts say it's the best and clearest image ever taken of a sighting in Scotland. The shimmering light was caught on tape as it hovered over Falkirk late last month. Barry McDonald and his girlfriend had been out driving when they saw the object just before dusk. We just looked up to the right hand side and that's when we seen the light in the sky. We were just sitting still when we first spotted it. 
The pair say they watched the object for 15 minutes before remembering there was a camera in the car. They were only able to record about a minute of footage before the UFO vanished, but that was enough to interest researchers. In fact, the object is stationary in the kind of movements that it makes, and then it's disappearing. I would say we were in the obvious phenomenon. That's what makes it so intriguing. Those experts at Sterling University are analyzing the footage frame by frame. Hundreds of UFO phenomena are reported in Falkirk every year. UFO sightings in the Middle East have been on the rise as well. The most unusual episode is reported in Nazareth, Israel, where a 62-year-old man claims to have been abducted by aliens. He says the aliens examined him through mysterious yellow powder in his face. The yellow substance is analyzed at this point. Officials say it's an aluminum compound that's not found in any local soils. They've sent the samples on to the U.S. for further tests. As last month when they spotted what appeared to be an amphibious UFO in Australia. Witnesses say the object rose from the sea. They described the large object as a silver ball surrounded by light. After dropping rapidly into the ocean, the UFO apparently ascended again and flew off into the northern sky. Doesn't get strange. Of the infamous vampire beast of Mexico, the goat sucker, Chupacabra. Some say it's a stuff of fiction. Others swear it's horribly real. It surfaced in Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and nine of the 31 Mexican states. Believers say the terrifying chupacabra has left its mark on the suck-dry carcass of many an animal. And even though some people are willing to joke about the chupacabra, mysterious attacks continue. Could this be the culprit? From Hermosillo in Mexico's Sonoro State, pictures of what some people claim are the remains of the fanged menace. A farmer in the area discovered the remains a month after his 24 sheep were massacred and sucked dry. Mexican officials believe the chupacabra did this and that the monster is very real. Desde luego, insisto, es un vampiro. I insist that it is a vampire. It could be a variation or a mutation or a new species of vampire. Animals in the United States may not be safe either. There have been reports from Miami that the chupacabra has been attacking household pets there. It's a horrifying concept, a foreign object surgically implanted in your body by an alien being. Is it possible? Some alleged abductees said they have proof in the form of doctor's x-rays. I've noticed complex ringings and beeping sounds in my ear at times, and the ear will turn bright red and get very hot. And it's physical proof of something. I'm going to have this object removed, and we're going to study it. Best-selling author Whitley Strieber is talking about an object he believes aliens put in his earlobe. He wants it removed. Los Angeles surgeon Roger Lear and hypnothesiologist Daryl Sims say they've met 30 other people who may have alien implants, and that they've documented over 100 more cases. They could be tracking devices, or they could be behavior-controlling devices. They may be devices for monitoring uh, body functions. Lear and Sims say they've even surgically removed objects patients claimed were put there by aliens. One of these patients is Pat Perinello, whose childhood memory of a flying saucer landing at his feet is as vivid as if it were yesterday. The thing started to spin. When I turned to run, break away from it, it was like an explosion. The thing seemed to went off and it felt like something grabbed my hand right here. And then I blacked out. It was 1954, a record year for UFO sightings. But no one believed the boy who grew up making paper models of the alien craft he says took him away. Pat finally had his hand x-rayed. That's when I saw this little triangular thing in, the, in, in my hand x-ray. And I pointed it out to the doctor and told me it was a cyst, not to worry about it. But that, that memory of what happened on the farm came back to me, that explosion and that feeling of it grabbing my hand. Dr. Lear and Daryl Sims took on Pat's case and re-examined his x-rays. This is a view looking across the top of the hand and we see this uh, small metallic object just adjacent to the bone. He said that was put there. Trained in a trauma room, Dr. Howard Mandel says he's not surprised that people are finding metal objects in their hands and feet. There are probably millions of people who have accidentally had something thrown into their hand or foot. We step on things with our feet all the time. We use our hands uh, with machinery all the time. The objects are real. They're really coming out of people. Someone put them there. In August 1995, Dr. Lear and his surgical team removed the metal object from Pat Perinello's hand. This is the uh, 
view of the object uh, immediately after it was removed, and this is the uh, membrane, this very dark gray dense membrane that covers it. It would be virtually impossible for the body to do that by itself. Nonsense, says Dr. Mandel. And the body's response to that would be to protect it from getting infected, and the immune system reacts by laying down fibrin in deposition of material that prevents infection. Their uh, scientific method is illogical. Um, their research is not scientifically based. Uh, their conclusions are foolhardy, and I'm open-minded. <laughs> Lear and Sims are planning their next surgery. They say the lab tests on their first two may prove that aliens are putting tracking devices in humans. What I think it will show, I have no earthly idea what it will show. I might emphasize earthly. Doctors Lear and Sims offer implant removal to their patients free of charge. Hmm, well, Before I... Neil Armstrong ever set foot on the moon, Navajo Indians believed their ancestors traveled through space. So when NASA came calling to test its Mars rover on the reservation lands, many of the Navajos wondered, what took you so long? Senior correspondent Jim Forbes reports. Into this incredibly beautiful but primitive land, where electricity is scarce, and where only a thin ribbon connects it to the outside world, there comes a stranger. Crawling across the desert floor, it seduces the bewildered, the fascinated, the curious. <laughs> Designed by NASA and the Russian Space Agency, this rock-crunching buggy will one day explore the surface of Mars robotic arm extending to photograph and then scoop up samples of the Martian soil. And where better to test its capabilities than the barren Navajo desert? To the outsider, this may appear to be the 19th century meeting the 21st, but the reality is the Navajo are much more comfortable with the idea of space exploration than most of us, because it's a long-held Navajo belief that they've already traveled through space. Oh. This isn't strange to the Navajo people at all, this whole idea of space travel, is it? No, it isn't. In our uh, oral history, my people were involved in space travel. James Peshlikai is a Navajo medicine man and oral historian who teaches young Navajos the story of the white shell lady and her twin sons. It's depicted in these murals on the walls of Gray Hills Academy in Tuba City, Arizona. The twins, one day they decided to uh, see their father, the sun, and so they went east to the edge of the land. From the edge of the land, they uh, went into space. They traveled to their father, according to Navajo legend, on the rays of the sun. Once there, the twins were warned not to ignore the lightning bolts for the return trip home. If you hesitate, it's going to leave without you, and you are going to be marooned in space forever. And so elders didn't hesitate, as it was the dawn of an exciting new chapter in the legend of Navajo space travel when NASA approached the tribe asking to test its rover on reservation land. When I first came here, one of the first people that I talked to told me that Navajo people believe that we came from the stars and that it's our destiny to return to the stars. And this seems to me like it's right on that path. Not only does the land simulate the Martian surface, the desert is also rich with fossils evidence of the earliest life forms on Earth. Which is exactly the kind of thing that we'd like to find on Mars. And so Russian scientists, alongside those from NASA, watch as Navajo school children guide the rover across the desert terrain. Others send navigational instructions from computer labs and reservation schools, while still others actually control the rover by satellite from NASA's Ames Research Center in Northern California. I'm thrilled that I have a part of this, part of the research. 16-year-old Jennifer Walters plans to attend Johns Hopkins Medical School to become a cardiologist. This rover could be on Mars, and I was a part of the research. I had a little piece put into it. Traditional Navajos believe that the very first close-up images of the surface of Mars, or any other planet for that matter, may well produce evidence that their ancestors were already there long ago. Maybe the footprint or stains of the tobacco from their pipes of peace. There are many tribes who have stories around star knowledge. Engineer Dr. Norbert Hill, an Oneida from Wisconsin, says that when it comes to space travel, NASA is only catching up. 
to what Native Americans have always understood. It's a much deeper meaning than just looking at space and rocks as purely science. It's about going to meet your relatives. Wow, that's incredible. Jim joins us now live on the set. Jim, did the tribe's beliefs actually have anything to do with why NASA chose a reservation? Actually not, Emmett. That's not what brought them there. What brought them was the landscape. If you look at it, it's about as close to Mars as we have here on Earth. And then, because there are so many fossils on the Navajo Desert, what they're testing with the rover are the cameras to see if they can pick up the images of the fossils because they know exactly where they are and then they can, you know, check their data to see if it's correct. Of course, on Mars, they're not going to be able to walk there to see. <laughs> All right. Wow. Weren't the Navajos are reluctant to actually allow NASA on their land? You would think so, Dana, because the Navajo regard their land as very sacred and imagine a government agency requesting its use. But this is where their beliefs come in, because because of those beliefs, they felt very comfortable with the idea of space travel. That's why they allowed it. That's great. All right. It's always attracted tourists to its beaches and its ruins. But now, some say it's become a prime destination for visitors of another kind, extraterrestrials. Correspondent Stacey Galandi went out on a paranormal patrol to search for UFOs in North America's hotbed of alleged alien activity. We begin our trip with a singular goal, to witness what so many claim to have seen here before, UFOs soaring through the night sky. As we soon discover, we are not alone in our search. The curious come in droves with the same idea. I want to see a UFO. I came here in search of UFOs. The UFO expedition begins here in Mexico City. Our group of travelers are here chasing a dream to actually catch a glimpse of an alien craft. And by the looks of it, their chances are pretty good. If I could see one fairly close up, um, it would be very important to me. They come from all walks of life in search of one thing, contact from beyond. Joyce Murphy is their guide. We're going to have a very tremendous experience. Joyce is the president of the Texas-based Beyond Boundaries, a company that specializes in alien adventures. Mexico, she says, is a hotbed of ET activity. It's not 40-year-old phenomenon. It's very current. It's very alive. It's happening now, you know, like right now. <laughs> Since this is my first trip, I join Joyce's group hoping to see a spaceship. Our first stop is just an hour south of Mexico City, the legendary village of Tepetzlan. In the town marketplace, reports of fantastic phenomena, villagers eager to share their personal sighting stories. I myself haven't seen them, but my sister has seen the light. Yes, I've seen the light. I have seen UFOs here in Tepoztlan seven times. UFO investigator Ruben Castro says this town is famous for a spectacular UFO called the Plasma Craft, a spaceship that's said to be a living, breathing source of energy, captured, he says, on this home video. From Tepetzlan, our own investigation takes us further south to Atlixco, a bustling village at the base of the active volcano Mount Popo. As we venture closer, the moment we've been waiting for. Oh my God! Our first alien sighting, but this one doesn't fly. It's a natural formation on the mountain, the face of an alien being, seemingly carved into stone. 16-year-old Adriana Acevedo is one at Leaksco resident who says she's met a real-life alien. They try to rescue us from something that will happen. They'll try to rescue some of us. Adriana's experience is not unusual in these parts. We venture northwest to the tiny village of Metapec, three hours outside of Mexico City. Metapec is poor, but it is rich with tales of the unexplained. We meet Claudio Gonzalez, a shepherd boy who tells us of prophecies given to him by alien visitors. They were not walking. They were like floating. It sounds like a dream come true for anyone in search of UFOs, a search that for us would end with an actual sighting of a UFO hovering in the night sky. Cut the light off, cut the light off. What happened? What happened? Oh, no, 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 the Wow. The strange sightings in the skies above Mexico reports of unconventional spaceships. As correspondent Stacy Galandi tells us, they're called 
plasma crafts. Behind me are the hills of Tepetlan, a mystical village tucked neatly away just south of Mexico City. For years, this has been the center of UFO activity. And for many of the villagers here, they say they've actually seen a UFO, something they call a plasma craft. <laughs> They are bright enough to cause cocks to crow in the dark of the Mexican night. I remember a very low noise like this coming from this ship, but suddenly the UFO stopped and shot up very fast against the hill of the light. It disappeared. Mexican TV reporter Ruben Castro has been investigating UFOs, what the Mexicans call OVNIs, since 1990. He's personally witnessed the plasma craft seven times, five of them here in Tepetzlan. They are not what he expected an alien ship to be. I expect for a metallic disc, but this ship is very different to the others. I think that it's a cloud of energy or maybe like a plasma. Since Aztec times, tales of strange phenomena have come out of Tepetzlan. Recorded history speaks of a sighting by a Spanish soldier over 500 years ago. I saw UFOs many times in the wall of the hills and running and jumping from one hill to another. It was a very bright light and it changed colors. We were playing football here and we look around where my friend told me that he saw three bright lights. And then we saw one of the lights fly very fast to the other side of the hill. The field where so many sightings occur is actually a volcanic valley surrounded by hills. The ancient Aztecs told of a thin luminescence that surrounded the hills in the night. And today, it is still called the Hill of Light. Photographer Carlos Diaz captured these remarkable pictures and has been documenting UFOs for 15 years. Whenever I'm going to have a sighting, I have this strange feeling in my solar plexus, which is a very pleasant feeling very much, like when you are deeply in love. On December 3rd, 1991, he left his video camera on a tripod in his kitchen, then walked out into the soccer field to set up a light. What he didn't realize was that the plasma craft was right behind him. And if that video isn't shocking enough, Diaz told us of his visits with aliens. I've been on board hundreds of times. When I get close to the ship, about 10 meters, I begin to feel a very comfortable pleasure over my body. It's like some kind of volume was turned on and my senses grow. I can feel more, I can smell more, I can hear more, and I can feel how life flows inside and outside of me. On board, Diaz says he sees nothing but yellow light and his body undergoes a transformation. Something that I understood since the first time I went into the ship is that when you go in, you become part of the whole thing. In Tepetzlan, UFOs are commonplace, whether they appear here on wall murals or high in the sky. They are not considered a mystery. They are simply a part of everyday life. And as the villagers say, it's just what adds to the magic of Tepetzlan. I'm Stacey Galandi for Strange Universe. Metepec, Mexico, a tiny farming town quickly becoming known as a UFO hotbed. Both villagers and visitors say it's a place where heaven truly does meet Earth. Here's correspondent Stacey Galandi with another installment of our special series, The Mexico Files. <laughs> It is a tiny spot on the map, a picturesque village that sits beneath the grandeur of Mount Popo. Behind me is the volcano Mount Popo, located here in Metepec, Mexico. This week, a yellow alert was issued when the volcano erupted. The villagers of this town say when the volcano is active, so are UFO sightings. Just outside of town is Mexico's second largest crater. It's been erupting since the 14th century, and when it blows, lava isn't the only spectacular sight to see. Norberto Salgado is a self-proclaimed UFO expert who claims to have seen it all. Since 1991, I have been dedicated to unexplained phenomena in this area. We have seen flashes, lights. In some of the light flashes, we also see smoke. This summer, 
summer, Norberto captured the eruption of Mount Popo on home video. He also captured mysterious dancing lights plunging in and out of the top of the volcano. Within three months, we recorded very unusual activity from the lights and flashes on top of the volcano. Norberto and other locals believe the dancing lights are alien spacecraft that have been visiting Mount Popo for hundreds of years. They are here, they are with us. Why do they come? Villagers believe the volcano could be an energy source or a secret underground meeting place for aliens. Taxi driver Javier Ramirez has lived in Metapec at the foot of Mount Popo all his life. He claims to have seen several UFOs, including one just four months ago. I was in the gas station and I saw a UFO hovering overhead, vibrating for five minutes. It moved slowly and then it flew away at a very high speed. Javier and other villagers believe alien visitors are in Mexico to befriend humans and they have been here long before the Aztecs. They say Mount Popo is being guarded by alien eyes on this alien face naturally carved into a mountain next to the volcano. Javier agrees there is nothing to fear. I am not scared of these visitors because of their technology. I believe if we don't attack them, they will leave us alone. The volcano is a constant source of energy for the spaceships, an energy that villagers say the aliens need for space travel. Since the aliens take away energy from the land, they also give something back. They watch over the volcano and prevent it from erupting. The villagers say they will always be safe as long as their alien angel watches over them. Reporting from Metapec, Mexico, I'm Stacy Galandi for Strange Universe. ...of eyes peer into the starlit sky. Suddenly, the crowd falls silent as up in the sky it hovers, a UFO. Skeptical? Well, you take a look at what our camera captured when correspondent Stacy Galandi went out on a UFO watch. <laughs> It was a night we'll never forget. Under a luminous moon in the valley of Mount Popo, its intense volcanic heat highlighted by our Army night scope, we looked out into the mysteries of the Mexican sky. Well, we're high up here in the mountains of Metapec, Mexico for a night watch. A night watch where all the local villagers come together and meditate in hopes of making contact with E.T. It had happened before on this spot. My crew and I and other UFO hunters were hopeful as we arrived around 8.30 p.m. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Stacy. I was talking with some of the local people when suddenly... Everybody started yelling that that, that was a UFO. I turned and then I saw the, uh, the, uh, the light. I grabbed my camera. I saw it perfect. What our cameraman Domingo Rex and the rest of us saw was what we had only dreamed of seeing. At first it was just a bright light in the sky. No, 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 no. Turn off the light. Shutting off our TV lights, we watched as the light grew brighter, then dimmer. And it was moving very slowly, going up, going down, going fast, going slow, and then it came all the way to the right, and then all the way to the left. We strained to hear the familiar drone of a plane or beating of helicopter blades, but there was no sound from the sky. Suddenly, the lone light became two. Then a flashing red spot appeared and flickered around the main source. The light hovered for several minutes before it finally disappeared. The six-minute sighting stunned us all. Did you see it stop and change? Yeah. That's not an airplane, honey. It can't stop see that. Oh, my God. <laughs> my producer, Tony, and I reacted much like the rest of the group. It's my very first one. I've been chasing them all over the world for years. It goes right to your heart because, you know, life as we know it does not exist. Life is much more than we have ever been taught. Yeah, everybody's been having fits and all been crying and everything else because it's been so exciting. Do you really truly think that that was some sort of unidentified flying object? I'm absolutely sure of it. Yeah, I really am. I truly am. Like but not everyone in our group was so certain. Uh, but it didn't display any of the behaviors of a UFO that I'm aware of. Whatever it was did reappear about five minutes later and lingered just for a minute. We stood and talked long into the night, and the next day on the bus, I described my feelings on seeing this strange light in space. 
there was a, an instant feeling of like wanting to cry. There is definitely an excitement that just sort of like goes over your whole body because you're thinking this is a UFO that is not of this earth. That is really something. Stacy joins us in studio right now. You were there. What was it like to see it in person? Well, we were so lucky because we had been out every night. And when we actually saw it, it was such an amazing experience. And the video really doesn't do it justice. It's so much better in person. And we're already in the process of having it analyzed, are we not? Yes. In fact, when we were in Mexico, we had a researcher there who analyzed the footage and really just had no explanation for it. But we have sent the video out to an independent analyst here in the States. And we hope to have those results in the next few weeks. All right. Well, look for our Mexico files comes a warning to the world world from two teens who say they've had close encounters with aliens. Correspondent Stacey Galandi has a story. We're in the Mexican village of Atlixco, located at the base of the volcano Mount Popo. This is a village that has had numerous UFO sightings and alien contact. One 16-year-old girl says she's had contact and made friends with the aliens, and she's even brought back an important message. Adriana Acevedo is the daughter of a prominent attorney, a humble, unassuming teenager. She has led a privileged life but nothing could have prepared her for an experience she calls a miracle. What happened was, on June 20th, 1995, in my house, around 2 or 3.30 in the morning, I was sleeping. I felt like someone turned on the light. Adriana says she got out of bed and went to her window. That's when she saw an alien spacecraft sitting in the garden outside her balcony. These photos were taken by Adriana's father to prove it was not a dream. It was a big metallic object with a little pulsating light. Adriana says the ship was filled with beings that resembled humans. I saw small men, white, but their skin was smooth. Some people say they've seen them with eyes like this, but their mouths are very small and their noses are small. The visitors were friendly and made Adriana feel loved. She claims they chose her for a reason, to send an urgent message that humans are destroying the natural beauty of planet Earth. They believe in God, and they say we must all believe in God and follow the laws he's given us. Adriana says the visitors did not speak with her. They communicated telepathically, sending messages to her brain. She says they have visited her three times urging her to love her family and all of humanity. How do we prepare? Well, just be good. Adriana is not the only teenager who claims to have made contact with alien beings. This is the village of Atlamaya. It's a small, poor village, but it's rich in UFO sightings. One shepherd boy we found here lives with his family in a house with crumbling walls and no roof. His life is very difficult, but he says that the day he encountered aliens changed his life forever. We were taking care of our goats when suddenly we saw a light. He says it happened six years ago. Claudio Gonzalez was only nine. We didn't know what it was. We couldn't see anything from the light because the light was hurting us. Claudio says the alien visitors told him they were here because of the volcano. Legend has it alien spaceships may be using Mount Popo as an energy source or an underground station. All they asked was, why were so many people coming to see them? Claudio says the visitors were about three feet tall. Other than that, their faces were a blur. But he remembers what they said, like it was yesterday. They said there's going to be a big war. Claudio says the aliens gave no date for their prophecy of doom, but they predicted the next world war would take place in New York City. After a moment, the aliens disappeared. We went looking for them and didn't find anything. They floated away. That was the only time Claudio says he ever made contact with alien visitors. To this day, Claudio does not know why he was chosen. I don't know why. I was just there. But Adriana believes she was chosen because she is quiet and trustworthy. She feels she's been given a mission. Me siento muy bien. I feel fine, but it's also a huge responsibility because I'm also afraid I may fail. And so in a small area of Mexico, beneath an alien face naturally carved into a mountainside, two children live very different lives. Both say their lives will never be the same. We're told that Adriana doesn't want to divulge all the information she has because she doesn't want to violate a trust.